On today's program, I interview Deborah D. Giovanni. Deborah D. Giovanni appeared in the fifth season of Last Comic Standing. She's been voted the funniest comedian in Canada many times over. She's been on the great radio show The Debaters. She's a regular on the Comedy Network. She's a big, big star. One of the biggest I've had on the show. I might have to say that. Click like, comment below, subscribe to the channel, and enjoy the show. <laughs> Deborah D. Giovanni, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Nice to be on the show. Deborah, the number of successful male comedians far outweighs the number of females. In your opinion, why are men so much funnier than women? Ha! Uh, that's not my opinion at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that I think that there are just more men out there doing comedy, or there, that was the case for a long time, but it won't be the case forever. So those numbers will be skewed very soon. That'll be a, that'll be we'll have a whole different whole different uh, sort of a answer in about 10 years i would say i think that'll be a thing of the past i think it's just it's it's honestly just a numbers game that's it like i think more people can name more male comedians just because for a long time there were more male comedians that's that's kind of all there is to it you know i've been doing comedy for 17 years now and i mean truly even in 17 years i would say the the number of female comics is it like just in my little world has it doubled easily you know, so it's um, yeah, it's 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 uh, picking up. We're picking up pace. Quickly. And the stuff that they can talk about too has changed. Absolutely, absolutely. I think so too. I also think that's a thing as well. It's not 50 years ago. You know what I mean? Taboo doesn't exist anymore. Even the world, the word is old fashioned. You know what I mean? Like it just, it just doesn't exist anymore. So I think that I think that really opens doors for a lot of women. So you're on last comic standing. I have a couple questions about that because I was actually interested to learn, and I just learned it recently that there were questions about the legitimacy of the show, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. What do you know about it? You see, I, I was I was in the year, uh, I was in 2007. Yeah, you were in the first year, right? I was on. Yeah, it was, I think it was like the third year. Like, you know, they did it once, and then they stopped, then it was canceled in the second season, then they brought it back. Yeah, it's been canceled like 10 times now. Several times, right? And they keep they keep tweaking it. So I was still in the seasons where, like, they made us do stuff other than just straight stand-up comedy. Um, so I feel like as they, you know, they, as they went along and sort of just turning it into just a straight up, like, you know, American Idol of comedy kind of thing, I feel like, it, you know, it got better. But, I mean, I, I don't know. I know it was, a, you know, I know it's a show. I know reality TV is always a show. You know, they're, they're casting a show. You know what I mean? So is it completely legitimate? Probably not. Um, but, you know, I think I think it's more legit than it isn't, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that I don't think it's all, um, you know, completely rigged. Like, I definitely know they're casting a show. But uh, I also know that they, you know, they were also, for the most part, going for the comedians they, they liked and wanted and, and so on. Well, if they're casting a show, you know, those would be the best comedians, right? Yeah, exactly. They'd be the best comedians, but it's, let's be honest, you know, the, the, the year that I went up, I mean, my God, the, some of the best comedians ever didn't make it through, uh, to the top 10. And, you know, and I think that that's, you know, they needed a, God, they had a, a, a British guy where they had three girls. Um, so I think what three or four people of color, you know, they, they were, they were, they were, it was a, it was a thing. You know what I mean? It was a blueprint they were filling in. Um, you know what I mean? Like Tommy John again didn't make it into the top 10. I mean, come on. That's insane. He's one of the best comics in the world. And so that, those sorts of things, you know, John uh, Camparulo didn't make it. I mean, like just things that you, like, Ryan Hamilton, it's, yeah, it's, um, there was some definite crazy missteps. You know what I'm saying? Do you know Rich yeah. Voss? I do. He was on a couple of seasons. Yeah. I don't know if he was on the same season as you. No, were. he wasn't. I think he might have been the year, either year before or year after. I can't remember which one. Yeah, he roasted me last week at the comedy club. Oh God bless! How terrifying! How terrifying was that? Was that all right? <laughs> so here's the thing. I, yeah. My girlfriend's in Cuba. Yeah. And uh, I decide, well, I'm going to bring my parents. Yeah. And, oh, and I always God. sit in the front row because I'm a big shot, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, m my stepdad decides at the last minute he's not going to go. Okay. But my mom shows up. So it's just me and my mom sitting in oh. the front row. And now all of a sudden I'm on a date with my mother. Oh, God. Sitting in the front row. And of all comedians, it's Rich Voss, right? And he's going to roast you. Oh, and my God. And he's going to roast me, and he sure did. Oh, my God. 
that was I look forward to seeing that. <laughs> I was going to say if it's ever available. No, it's not it. available. Unfortunately, oh. it's just in my memories. Oh God! Yeah, in your psyche, in your nightmares. Yeah, and it made yeah. me think. You know, I never seen a comedian personally that had done such good crowd work. Oh as, yeah, as Rich oh, Voss. Gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you do crowd work? What do you think about it? Is that is that the true test of a comedian? You know what? That's a that's a good question. I the other night was at um, the Improv and I watched Kira. Oh gosh, so what's her? her I'm going to mess up her last name so badly. So Donovich, God bless her. She was on. She did Last Comic Standing too. Fabulous. I'm I'm sorry, Kira, that I'm messing up your last name so badly. Um, but she, her entire set was talking to the crowd. And I was like, as a comic who we don't, you know, we're jaded at this point. Laughter is, you know, it's harder to squeak laughter out of us. I mean, I was screaming with laughter. It was so funny. Like it just, I think it is, I think someone who's good at crowd work is just one of my favorite things to watch. Um, you can't fake it. It's, it's the, it's so pure. I mean, Ian Bag, do you know Ian Bag? I mean, my God, he's it, just brilliance, absolute brilliance. Um, I don't spend a lot of my time doing crowd work, but I know, I mean, I can, you know, cause you're exactly right. I think it is absolutely, um, one of the sort of, uh, one of the, the factors into making a good comic. I mean, it, you know, being sharp and being fast on your feet is what sort of, I think, tells us that we can be comedians. So I think, um, you know, talking to the crowd is, you know, always uh, sort of an example of that. Um, but just as I've gone on in my life, because I, do, I, you know, I don't host as much as I used to. I don't MC as much as I used to. And that was way more time, you know, uh, talking to the crowd. But now it's like, now it's just sort of rapid fire succession. You know, if something happens in the room, I'm going to, I'm going to deal with it. But my God, just seeing a comic, like really just spend their entire 12 minutes talking to the crowd. Oh, it, it can really be a thing of beauty. He did an hour, I'd say. Oh, God. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, impressive. Impressive. I love that, too. I love it, too, because it's it's completely – you cannot recreate it. That's why it's so fun, too. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just – if you were, if you were in that room and you saw Rich Voss doing an hour – I mean, that's it. You're not going to ever see that again, and that's beautiful because I think people forget that comics, you know, you know, our set is our set. You know what I mean? You're, you, know, we, you know what we're going to say. Uh, and that's why I think crowd work is, is so special. It's like you cannot, you can't recreate it. It's never going to happen again. But what about Seinfeld's take on everything? You know, you, you've paid to see Seinfeld. So here's the Seinfeld show. And you know, you're going to see 70% of the same stuff you've heard before. Yeah, that's fair. Well, you see, I have, that's, that's a hard one. That's a, it's sort of a tricky one to answer because I have, a, you know, I'm really on the fence. Like I look at it like, a concert. You know what I mean? You go to a concert and, you know, if the band that you're going to see doesn't play the album that you like, you're like, what is going on? Why aren't you, you know, what? Like, can, you know, have you ever been to a concert where they're like, we're going to play stuff from the new album that we haven't heard yet? You're like, what the fuck? You're mad. You know, you're, it's like, I want to sing along to the songs that I know. Yeah. I remember when the Stones came to town and they didn't play Painted Black and. Like, come on. Come on. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's, that's, that's, it's enough to riot. Do you know what I mean? Like, there are moments where it's just like, I mean, yes, you want to hear some new stuff, but you really want the stuff that you know and love, right? So I, in, in that sense, you know, doing 70% of your, of your set, I got no problem with. I really, I really, really don't. But, you know, personally, as a comedian, I bore easily and I like to, you know, have fresh material and new stuff and, or even like, or even just, you know, adding on to old material. I, I just personally, um, I like new, uh, you know, I, I just do just, and that's for selfish to, to enjoy myself on stage. I also never want, I never want people to, you know, um, complain that there was too much old material, you know, that I'm, even though that doesn't really happen, like my brain is always Yeah, but jokes can be, jokes can be timeless. You don't have to jokes, be. Oh, absolutely. Jokes can be timeless and people have their favorite jokes and you ask any comic after a set, after a headline, after a, a theater show. If you don't do a joke, people come up and be like, oh, I was hoping you were going to do. I mean, that just that just happens. You know what I mean? They People want to see their favorites. They just do. I mean, that being said, I think, you know, um, doing a long set, you know, peppering. I, the theater show, a little harder to do cr uh, crowd work. You know what I mean? When you're far away from the crowd, it's kind of harder. Um, but I think, you know, it just sort of – it connects the room as well. Like you start off your headline set at a club or something and you're in the room – it just it just connects you with the audience and then they all feel like it's special and it's you know just for them and that kind of thing. So I think it's like 
you know, maybe maybe not 70-30, but, you know, some some sort of fraction in there that usually, you know, that can work out. I think it's nice. I think it's, I think I do. I just think it's nice. I'm not ever mad at anyone if they don't do uh, uh, crowd work or if they just stick to the hits, but, you know, personally. So that's it. I mean, see what I mean? So it's like, it, it, it doesn't matter. Like, whatever, you know what I mean? It's like, absolutely, only your set, fabulous. Only crowd work fabulous. This is the beauty of comedy, isn't it, Russell? Well, here's another thing. You talked about clubs and large venues. Now, you're coming to Vancouver on September yes. September 23rd. That's my son's 10th birthday. Ah! Lovely. That's your gift to me, Deborah. Oh! <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's 350 seats. Now, this is yep. substantially bigger than the comedy mix, which is about 85. Yeah, yeah. Why the bigger venue? I guess more seats, uh, more tickets, but... Uh, how does it feel doing the large venue versus the club? Well, you see this, okay, in that sort of situation, like 350 is a lot of seats, you know, in my, in my world, it is, you know, in someone like Russell Peters, that's like an open mic, you know what I mean, for him. Um, but there's something about like moving from comedy clubs into small theaters, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of venues that it's like a one night only sort of thing. That's very exciting because that is, that means that people that want to see you are coming to see you clubs. A lot of the times, yes, it is definitely people that are fans that are coming to see Deborah DiGiovanni, but you still have, you know, 30%, 50% of the people going to the club because it's what they do on Friday nights. You know what I mean? That you still have people at the door going, Who, who's the headliner tonight? I don't know. Some girl. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that still happens. And at a theater, that's not going to happen. No one's, no one's kind of just like accidentally buying tickets to come see me. So there's something really glorious about performing to a crowd of people who really want to be there. You know, that really want to, because you, I still look out into clubs and, and, you know, into the audience and I still see, you know, men with their eyes closed and, you know, kind of there because their wife dragged them kind of thing. And, and that just doesn't, that just doesn't happen in theater. So that's very special. It's, I mean, again, is it a little selfish? Sure. But I also think that as comics, that's our kind of our, it's sort of the progress, right? It's like, you know, open mic and then bigger rooms and then headlining clubs and then small theaters and then, you know, stadiums. It's, it's kind of just, um, the stepping stone, you know, it's also nice too to just do one show. That's also really lovely is to, you know, come into Vancouver, do one big show rather than five or six at a club, you know? I think, I mean, honestly, as much as we all love being on stage, I think, I think if you asked anyone, they'd rather do like one bigger show as opposed to seven smaller, you know? Yeah. Well, it's still work, right? Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Still work. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. If you could do in one day what you could do in seven, most of us could choose one day. Are you having a good time up there? I just said it's work. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is work. Um, and it's, it's, it's another kind of weird thing that a lot of people don't understand. It is our job. Um, which it, even saying it out loud sounds weird because it's like, we have such a fun job. It's, I mean, it's, you know, still glorious. I still love stand up comedy as much as I ever did, but there are nights when it feels like work for sure. And that's always a shame. Um, you know, when people ask us, you know, how the show go, we're usually answering on how much fun we had. Um, you know, even, even if the audience, response is good if you're not having fun which can happen you know what i mean it really can happen like you know the crowd liked you and everything went well but you didn't have that much fun um it was okay you didn't really maybe connect maybe you were kind of just you know going through the motions kind of thing it, it really depends so that to me it's like that's a good day at work but not you know not like a, a gold star kind of day because you really didn't the days that you just like when the time whips by and you look at your watch and you're like i've been on stage for 50 minutes and it feels like seven that those are the days that you just live for because when you're having when you're having so much fun you don't even realize how much time you've done or even you know i have a tendency to forget even what i was saying when i'm just uh when i'm really having a good time and connecting with the crowd um so it's like the variance is like some days yes it's awful uh, uh, some days it's absolutely brilliant but the in between is really probably i'd say makes up the most like there's a lot of just like really good days at work you know what i mean and it it's I, I'm lucky that I, um, you know, that I do love my job. Uh, but sometimes, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes you don't feel like being funny. You really don't. Sometimes you really don't feel like being funny. And it's, you know, those are the days where you kind of go, okay, this is it, you know, and you're really, um, yeah. So how do you prepare for that day? Yes. For those days. Well, that's the thing. It's just, it's like, okay. Uh, example, I did a, a school, a, a university in, uh, 
Pittsburgh not too long ago. And it was, I knew going in that it was going to be awful. Um, I was thrilled for the gig, you know, excited that I was able to do this. And then, you know, as we got closer, we found out the details of the show. And it was like, oh, okay, outdoors during the day. Uh, it was going to be like an, a carnival for the students. You know, you're going to be under a tent. Like, it just as it went on, we just like, okay, this is this is not going to be great. Um, you know, it, it's just not. Like, you know it. We've done it before. You know that there's not going to be a real sort of captive audience. People would sort of be walking past rather than sitting and watching. Um, you know, there was six of us doing 45 minutes each. So it was like a long day of comedy. I was taking bullet. I was going. So there was that thing where I just, I knew, like, you know, was in my little Airbnb going, okay, this is going to be work today. There is like the chances of it being fun were slim to none. Right. So, and that was, but I got through it and I did it with a smile and, you know, kind of went up there, did my time. Thank you very much. You know, thank the guys that did it kind of, you know, had lunch and, and, and went home, you know, but that is, I, I'm able to do that because I've been doing comedy so long um, because um, I have my material um, you know, I've got a, a lot of good material. I can do clean. I can do dirty. I'm prepared. Do you know what I mean? Like when you are prepared for the test, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna pass. You know what I mean? It may not be a killer every time, but in that situation that it was like, you know, talking to my best friend who was a non-comedian person, <laughs> she was just, you know, how do you do it? And I was like, because I can now, because now I can. Maybe I couldn't have 10 years ago, but now at 17 years in comedy, my arsenal is full. And those are the days that you go, today's a paycheck. And I'm going to do the best job I possibly can for this paycheck. But sometimes it's just a paycheck and you get through it. I mean, like, literally no one was watching. Like, literally, there might have been 18 kids sitting on a, on a hill, like, 100 feet away from me. I mean, honestly. And it was just, you know, you just go into automatic pilot. Your brain just goes, okay, let's just do this, you know? And, and you do. And you, and you can't believe it, but you get it done. Uh, I know those days. This is one of those. No, it's not one of those. <laughs> That's when you turn the mic off the entire time. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we're here with Deborah D. Deborah D. Giovanni, double D. Yeah. I'm sure you get jokes on that. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> My whole life. Here's a funny tweet from you. It's weird that someone would peel an onion to make them cry when you can just use your terrible childhood and save an onion. Yes. <laughs> Comedy from tragedy. Where does the funny come from? Oh, God, yeah. I am a big fan of uh, pain is funny. I really am. Uh, for me, it's, it's the connection thing again. Like not, not, you know, it, it still has to be funny. Like you have to make the pain funny, but I think that, you know, coming from broken spots and coming from, you know, gosh, the things that, you know, most of us, not all of us, but most of us can, you know, relate to. I just think there's something about that, that it just, it just works. You know what I mean? Like it just, you know, there's that sort of like, Oh, it's funny. Cause it's true kind of vibe. I think that really works with, you know, past pain. I mean, everybody, you know, everyone's had something in their life. And I think there's that sort of like, it sounds so cheesy, but it's like that we're not alone in this. You know what I mean? Like this is, yeah, this happens to all of us. I don't know. I just think there's something about it that just, I enjoy it. I enjoy talking about it. And I really do think it's one of the things that sort of like, I don't know, it takes you from being, you know, a comic to being someone's favorite comic. You know what I mean? Like where, I don't know, like what people know me, um, I feel like that, like, I feel like, I mean, when I, when I, the, when I first started going, oh, okay, I, I feel like I, I know what I'm, you know, what I'm doing here and who I want to be on stage. It started because, um, people after shows, uh, again, my best friend, non-comedian person started noticing this, that people would come up to me after shows and they would say things like, you know, um, like I'd be, you know, on a, a lineup and I'd be with a bunch of my male friends and they'd be like, oh, good show, man. Good show, man. And then to me, they would say, oh, good show. You know, you remind me of my favorite babysitter when I was a kid. I, it's that, the connection. And I was like, oh, look at this. Okay. I see what's that. You remind me of my favorite teacher from grade school of my, my sister's best friend. Like it was, I don't know. Like there was something in my sort of truthful and honesty that, um, that connected with people. You know what I mean? People hug me after shows. I get that quite a bit. Um, I, I did a, a show in, where was that? It was in Minnesota. What's the name of that? Oh, comedy on state comedy on, Oh, have you ever been there? It's fantastic. And, and it's, it's one of the best clubs I've ever been in my life. Um, and one of the, the managers, uh, awesome people that run the club, uh, after one of my shows, he said to me that he was, you know, watching from the booth and that like, he, ne he said he'd never seen 
a comic get as many hugs as I did. He was like, he's like 21 people hugged you or something. And I was just like, oh, okay. And you know, it's always weird for me because after shows, I'm so sweaty and I'm always so, I'm always so embarrassed to hug people. I'm always like, I'm sweaty, but they still want to hug me. And there's something about that that I'm, uh, I'm really grateful for. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of weird, but it's also really wonderful that, you know, rather than just like, Hey, great show. People often say, can I give you a hug? And, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I just feel like that's, um, I don't think that happens to everybody. And I feel pretty grateful and appreciative that it does happen to me because, um, you know, people want to hug me. I, I mean, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's out of pity or joy. I don't know. I haven't figured that part out yet, but I'm never, I'm never going to turn it down. And I, I hope it never stops, to be honest. Well, I don't think you come off as an as an evil person. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You would never get that part in yeah, a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> you know, you're, so here's the thing. Like 17 years in the in the game, when you're starting out, I can imagine it's it's an act. You're oh, a yeah. bit of a phony, yes. right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, are you the realest you've ever been now, and is that proportional to how funny you can become? Uh huh. I think so. Absolutely. Um, I think that you know at the beginning. First three years, first five years, you know, some people it's eight or nine. I feel like you're just like, you know, okay, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I, you know, just finding your footing, um, you know, realizing you're funny. Um, and then, you know, when people always say, oh, persona, your persona is so well developed. It's so funny because most of us, our persona, you know, I mean, yes, there are definitely people that have personas that who that's who they are on stage and then who they are in real life is completely different. Um, but I, you know, my, my persona, I don't, it just happened. You know, I am, who I am on stage is really who I am, except just magnified, you know what I mean? Like sort of, uh, like by a thousand, you know what I mean? Like it's just turned up the volume a lot, um, kind of thing. But I definitely know the realer I get, the more, the more fun I have. Like I, I can't like, I, I have to be honest on stage. I mean, no one's ever a hundred percent honest, you know, and again, it's always, you know, honest but in comedy world so it's like you know there is exaggeration and there's you know uh parts that aren't real but it's there's a kernel of honesty like it started in truth for me and that's um i have to like i can't tell jokes that aren't true anymore like i mean my god i used to do jokes about my cat all the time people ask me you know are you gonna do jokes about your cat i'm just like no my, my cat died four years ago bless his heart may he rest um you know i so i don't talk about my cat anymore you know i just it's just it's not a part of my life you know, that kind of thing. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's a small little uh, piece of truth, but it, it just, it just is. So I feel like the more truthful that I am on stage, uh, the more fun I'm having and therefore the more fun the crowd is having, you know? Um, I also think that my comedy's changed quite a bit in the last like four or five years uh, since moving to LA. And um, I think that it's, you know, for some people that have known me forever, I think it's a transition that they're like, oh, okay, what's, what's going on here? But I am enjoying myself more than I ever have on stage. So on that note, moving to yeah. LA, I'm sure you've, you hang out with Jim Carrey and Michael J. <laughs> Fox and, yes, you know, all the lots. other Canadians <laughs> yeah. that, uh, what does the United States offer that Canada doesn't? And why LA and not New York? Okay. Um, all good questions. Now, God, you know this. I mean, truly, truly. I love Canada and I miss it so much. Um, we, I think we all know, uh, what a great country, uh, we are. And I, you know, I hope one day to be successful enough that I can live in Canada again. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's really what it is. Cause now at this point it needs to be like, you know, there needs to be an element of success so I can move to, you know, home to Toronto or to Vancouver. You know what I mean? Um, but unfortunately, you know, and the, the thing, I mean, America is just more, I mean, and when I say America, I really mean, you know, LA, I really mean California. It's just more, there's just more. I mean, Canada, it's my God, what was it? The last CRTC ruling. Now it's like 8% of all television has to be Canadian content. I mean, we're just, our, our entertainment industry flails on the best of days. You know what I mean? And it was just, um, it's just, I just, you know, I knew that I was going to have to, I was going to have to leave, you know, I'll say that, like, I, I didn't, trust me, I didn't want to, I didn't want to move to LA. Like, my, my brain was like, I would much prefer to live in Toronto for the rest of my days, but I knew that I had to because, um, 
as much as I am grateful to Canada, and I am, and I'm, I'm talking like, and this is not fans. This is not people that love my comedy uh, that have supported me because that, I mean, that will never stop. I'm talking the industry. Uh, they they weren't interested. They, you know, everyone was like, "Oh, you're everyone's favorite comedian." Like, not not the industry, not people that make TV shows. Absolutely not. Um, because you know, eventually you want to have a bit of stability in your life, and that means you know, working on a show, being a part of a show, something that you know you can do nine to five kind of thing. Um, so it was like, all right, you know, got to that sort of glass ceiling, if you will, and it was like, all right, time to go. And then moving to LA was the choice because. Um, rather than New York, uh, because of course we know that New York is, you know, stand up comedy at its best. Um, but for me, it was LA because, uh, it's inevitable. LA is just inevitable. It, it just is. New York is, I would have, I would have moved to New York if I would have thought of moving to America like in like, like 10 years ago. I would have gone to New York. But at that point, like, uh, I know who I am as a comic. Um, you know, New York is always good learning. You know, we tease and say, you know, you, you spend 10 years in New York. It's like 20 years anywhere else, right? Like it's just, you just become the best comic possible. But I, I knew that LA, uh, was inevitable. I mean, my God, all the, you know, most of the comics from New York, they're in LA, you know, half the time we're moving and it, it just is. It, this is it. Uh, you become a great stand up in New York and then you move to LA when you want to, you know, work in television or, whatever else you want to do, right? Movies, whatever. Um, and I, and I, you know, without being totally cliche, like I didn't really have the time. Like I'm, you know, I'm not, but do you uh, feel I'm, that you've missed something I, I mean, by not I, I, having yeah, that New honest, York experience? Yes, I wish. Oh God. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, just a those... few years doing the comedy cellar, right? Oh God. Yes. Oh yeah. Wow. But I feel like now at this point in my life, I mean, whatever, it's just like, I go, okay, you can't, I can't, I can't have regrets. I have to keep going. Um, but honestly, I moved to, I moved to LA in like the spring, summer of 2013. And like, I wish that I would have gone to New York in like, you know, 2012, 2011. You know what I mean? Like that sort of like done a couple years, but you know what? I didn't, I was working in Toronto and I had things going on. And so, you know, not being a, not being a young person, you know, not being in my twenties and my early thirties, like it was just like, I, I have to just go once and stay and establish myself and, and go. So it was really like, it was, I was just being you know, logical. Um, but if I would have, you know, if I could, if I could redo it, if I could take back the last 10 years of my comedy career, um, you know, I would have gone to New York. Yeah. Way earlier. And then, and maybe stayed forever or, you know, maybe done five years and then moved to LA. But, um, at, at the, at, you know, when I did, when I got the nerve to move, it was like, okay, I'm making one move and it's going to be Los Angeles. Now, Los Angeles means television, you can't swear yeah. on TV, yeah. not I usually. I know, boring, boring. I know that. But you but swear. Maybe a lot I of do, people don't do. know that because they see you on TV. But yes, I have a I have a foul mouth. I really do. Um, I love. Uh, there's certain words that I just adore. Oh, there are some wonderful swear words. Oh, God, far yeah. more than these seven that you can't say on television. Oh, they definitely God, are. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Do you get bigger laughs with the same joke if you swear? You know what? I would say, God, yes. You know, I mean, I don't, I, my, when I, when people that are listening and, you know, I, I am not like, it's not like fucking, fucking, fuck, fuck, fuck. It's not, it's not that. There are jokes that just need the, need the, the, the proper word. Do you know what I mean? It's like saying, you know, screw it or fuck it. It's just, it's a whole, you know, even just the word, like the, the K sound. Is yeah, a very that hard consonant sound. is funny. Yeah, exactly. It is, it is, right? It's just, it's just. Oh, it just lands, you know? So there are definitely, I mean, I, you know, cause I do, I mean, we do it all the time. We have to be clean or we have to be, you know, almost clean and yeah. And you get laughs, but you know, someone watching a gala on CBC or, you know, seeing me at a corporate show. Oh, I mean, I did, I, I was in Toronto not too long ago doing a corporate show, doing a, you know, a paycheck show where, you know, you're performing, you got to be a little nicer than you would be. Um, you know, I had a, I had a, a friend who I didn't know was going to be in the crowd, a friend of my sister's. She came up and she's like, Oh, great show. She's like, but that's not the show. I was like, Oh, of course that's not the real show. No, no, no. You know, she lives in Vancouver and I'd said, you know, I'll see you in Vancouver. You can come see me do the real show. That's it. You know, you, they, you, I think people that know, know they're missing a little something. Do you know what I mean? Uh, the real truth and the real sort of like the real gritty stuff that you really want to talk about. But I mean, yes. Am I funny without swear words? A hundred percent. Would I rather people see me doing the real jokes that I want to do? 
Uh, always, 100%. Always, always, always. I love the fitness intervention uh, yeah. corporate event. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. True story. That all happened. Is it really? Yeah, it is. Totally. Yeah, it was good life fitness. <laughs> God bless them. See, that's the thing is you've got to write comedy based around what happens that's funny Absolutely. in your life. Absolutely. Uh, one of my uh, favorite comics uh, in Canada who I grew up with, um, Fraser Young, he, you know, someone, God, you know, sitting around after a show, some young comic said, you know, what do you, what do you do to write jokes? And Fraser just said, you go outside. And that was, that's about it. You just leave your apartment and it comes to you. Any jokes that are off limits for you? Uh, I've heard um, some pretty dark stuff. I, you know who I'm a big fan of lately is Dave Landau, and uh, he does a lot of dark stuff. I don't, you know, Dave Landau, I'm not sure I know That's him. okay. I'll look it up. I'll find him. I'll Google him. Um, I love dark. I really do. I love, um, I love it when it, you know, ooh, it unsettles you a tiny bit. Because uh, funny is funny is funny to me. You know what I mean? I don't, the, the, the topic really doesn't bother me you know I mean? like if it's funny it's funny that being said there are you know you, you see it all the time you see people that you're just like uh, where they're just it's almost like they're trying too hard like they're trying to be you know when someone tries to be edgy that doesn't ever work you know what i mean like it just you're edgy or you're not trying to be edgy not gonna happen um i mean i think there i think there are certain things that you know there's good taste and then there's comedy but i really I really, really, really am trying to live as Joan Rivers did, you know, where she just never apologized. You know, that was it's like, I'm a comedian. It's my job to bring levity to every situation. And her and her, her, you know, in the last years of her life, she was really she really said, I, I refuse to apologize. I mean, yeah, there are certain things that I don't think I would attack uh, but just because it's just me as a person. Because uh, I don't actually want to hurt people. You know what I mean? I, I really don't. I, I really want I want people to have fun. But um, if I'm talking about it, whatever topic it is, it's probably because it's a part of my life. You know what I mean? Like where – that why I don't think I would make jokes about certain situations because it's it's not true to me. And therefore, I feel like, well, I, I don't have – I can't talk about that. That's not my life. You know what I mean? I wouldn't – like I don't feel like um, – I don't feel like I should be, you know, allowed to, oh God, I can't even think of a topic. Like I'm thinking like, you know, God, oh, the, the death of a, of your baby. I'm never going to make jokes about that. It's not, do you know what I mean? It's like, if, if that, if that had happened in my life somewhere along the line, you would probably, or maybe you wouldn't, maybe that's just too real. But you see, I don't know. Like, okay, Erwin Barker. Here's the one from Dave Landau. He's sick and tired of people showing him pictures of their baby, you know, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. here's my baby. So cute. Yeah. You know, one friend of his wife. She's been showing pictures, and it's, you just finally had to say, listen, it's enough. It's been two years now. They're not going to find them. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Oh, see that? I love that. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's a great joke. That's a great joke. That is a great joke because it's surprise, and it's a little awful, and God, that's great. That is great. It, Deborah, if the crowd laughs, yeah, that's it. That's it, it. That's the ultimate that's exactly truth. That's it. That's why no subject is taboo. If it's honestly, if it's making people laugh, you did your job. You did your job. You know, people will be like, "Oh, that's in poor taste." I'm like, "Is it or is it just not funny?" Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, it's that that whole thing. You know, it's like it's it really is. It's a, it's a fine line. You know, I mean, I think if you can make it funny, you can make it funny. I mean, fabulous Canadian comedian Erwin Barker passed away years ago, uh, died of cancer, and he was. On stage, obviously riddled with cancer, thin and and frail and pale, making jokes about his cancer. And, you know, and we would – and it was hysterical. And we would laugh and people would look and go, you know, how could he do this? And it's like, because it's his life and he has to. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. If you can make it funny, then, then I'm going to laugh at it. Dave Lando, good joke, good work. God damn, that's funny. I was still thinking joke. about it. Yeah. That's a great joke. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great joke. But Seriously. here's the thing. If a joke doesn't land, do you apologize? Yeah. You know who's apologizing today, of course, is Kathy yes, Griffin. Yes, of course. Yeah. Kathy Griffin yeah. for the beheaded Donald Trump that supposedly Barron saw. Um, yeah, I know. Please. Yeah, yeah, I don't know about that. But uh, yeah. I think he's – I just think that Trump is using uh, – he's pulling out Barron's name because he knows someone said, mention, mention, mention your child. And that would, that would be it. 
Baron. He probably hasn't even seen Baron. But here's Baron the thing: months. what happens if you cross that line, which apparently she did? Uh, do you, you apologize see, or do you eat it? That's a good one. That's a. I think that's a really hard one to answer, to be honest. Um, well, you wake up and you just told a bad joke, and all of a sudden you're on the top of the Twitter sphere, Deborah. What do you do? Well, I think that you you might like apologize in that you say, okay, maybe that wasn't my best joke, and you kind of move on. But apologizing for, um, I, I did actually watch your apology. Um, there's a little of it that there's a small part of me that feels a little a little sad that she apologized, but then the human part of me looks and goes. Okay, good on you, Kathy. You know what I mean? Like, just, you know, she she knew what she did was in bad taste. But at the same time, it's like the president is in bad taste. He is the, the president of bad taste. I mean, so it's kind of like, I don't know. I mean, everything that he's said and done, is it in any less... You know, is it is it is it more respectable than than what Kathy Griffin has done as a comedian? Do you know her job? I mean, especially Kathy too. Like this is not That's not Seinfeld doing that joke. It's Kathy Griffin. I mean, she is you know, she's low blow all the time. You know, so it's kind of you know. But but and then Trump go, he says terrible things as the president. And in, in, in like I mean, it's 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 a little it's a little weird that you know he's talking about bad taste. You know what I mean? So that's why I think a lot of comics might be looking going, you know, why we don't feel like she should need to apologize because it was directed at, you know, the, the, the king of just, you know, classless, tasteless, you know, Donald Trump. I mean, if this was, you know, if she was holding up the head of, my God, of some, you know, innocent kind, you know what I mean? That would, that would be a different story. But – I, I, just, I just, I feel like it's a little, is of, ironic the right word? Of maybe? Jesus Christ's know. head, for example. Yeah, exactly. That would you know have been I mean? very, like, very poor taste. Bit, like, Jesus, oh my God. But I, I feel like, I mean, again, you know, pretending you beheaded someone, not great. Uh, you know, not, not a, not a great joke, period. You know, yes, a little, uh, a little in poor taste. But the fact that it's Donald Trump kind of makes all of us go, ugh, you know, I wish, I wish she didn't have to apologize because, you know, let's be honest, everyone thinks about it. Deborah. Really had a good time talking to you today. Oh, thank you. You do great talking to you. Wonderful questions, by the way. Really nice. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm going to be in Vancouver because I live here. I'm going to go to your show. September 23rd at the York Theater. Yeah. 350 seats. Have you seen this place? Like some of the... No, I haven't. It's unbelievable. Uh, This is Vancouver's newest performance venue. Oh, great. And it's been completely restored. It was opened in 1913. Oh, wow. Oh yeah, it's got a mezzanine. Uh, oh, I'm excited. It's 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 incredible. Well, I look forward to meeting you. Well, I, I don't know how we can do that, considering uh, I'll be in a crowd of 350 people. Oh, I'll but... find you after the show. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll have a sweaty hug. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Uh, you, you know, you're living in LA. You're trying to get a show. You're, I'm sure you're doing pilots all the time. Yeah. Please. Uh-huh. You live next to an opera singing neighbor. Right? <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> he was literally just singing. I had, I almost had a moment was like, I'm going to have to go tell him to be quiet because I got to do this, but he stopped. So there you go. Because <laughs> <laughs> that would, that would be a good show. It would be a good show, wouldn't it? Yes. It would start out me being mad at him, but then we would fall in love. Oh my God. <laughs> there you go. Plot twist. I, I'm moving to LA and we're writing this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Deborah D. Giovanni, awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, the audience can. Tweet you at, at Deborah D. Giovanni, your website, same, same, DebraDGiovanni.com. And that's a hard name to say many times over. I know, over. so stupid. Why didn't shorten it? I don't know. Dumb. Anyway. Yeah, Deborah D. Thank you so <laughs> yeah, much you for being it. a guest. Have a great day. Thank you. Pleasure's mine.